Hi, everybody, and welcome to the uh, 2020 Art History Awards with the School of Art, Design, and Creative Industries at Wichita State University. Uh, we want to thank you all for joining us this, uh, this afternoon. Um, hopefully, you're seeing us. We're, we're new to this, and so the technical uh, difficulties are, uh, are awfully fun to, to work with. So um, once again, welcome. And I just want to say how proud I am of our students that are graduating this semester uh, when they started in the fall um, and then going into the spring. This is not at all what they expected for their, uh, their school year. So it's been uh, quite an adventure. And um, I'm really proud of the seniors who are graduating this year who were able to stick with it and finish their classes. And um, we're just, we're all very proud of them. So once again, thank you for joining us. Um, today, we have a great keynote speaker um, who will share some of her own art history practice with all of you. Um, if you're watching us live on um, YouTube, you can post comments. If you have questions, just put them in the comments field and we'll relay them to the speaker as we get going. So um, feel free to do that. And there'll be a question and answer period after um, her presentation. So with that being said, once again, for the fifth time probably, Welcome to everybody. And I'm going to now hand things off to Dr. Brittany Lockard, who will introduce our keynote speaker. I was gonna say thank you for coming, uh, but I feel like that's redundant now. Um, welcome, I'm, I'm Brittany Lockard. I'm the area head for art history. And I'm really excited to have Dr. Hollis Clayson as the keynote speaker for our 2020 Wichita State Art History Awards. Dr. Clayson, a historian of 19th century art, is professor of art history and Bergen Evans professor in the humanities at Northwestern University. She has a longstanding interest in the entanglement of visual art with artificial lighting technologies. She has published widely on Paris-based art practices, including the French capital's large population of artists from elsewhere. Her books include Painted Love, Prostitution and French Art of the Impressionist Era, and one of my favorite books from graduate school, Paris in Despair, Art and Everyday Life Under Siege, and Is Paris Still the Capital of the 19th Century? Essays on Art and Modernity, 1850 to 1900, co-edited with Andre Dombrowski. Her newest book focuses exclusively on art and lighting, Paris Illuminated, Essays on Art and Lighting in the Belle Epoque. In 2013 to 14, she was the Samuel H. Kress Professor at the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. In 2014, she was named Chevalier, uh, Chevalier dans l'Ordre de Palms Académiques. Uh, sorry about my French, Dr. Clayson. Um, she was a visiting Kirk Varnado Professor at the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University in fall 2015 and had fellowships at CASVA and the INHA in 2017 to 18. She continues to investigate the entanglement of art practices with artificial illumination technologies in a new study of the illuminated Eiffel Tower, its representations, and reception. We're also pleased to welcome her back because Dr. Clayson is a shocker. She taught art history here at WSU from 1978 to 1982. And once again, if you have questions for Dr. Clayson uh, during the talk, please put them in the comment section and we'll have a Q&A after her talk. So now I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Clayson. Wait, what's happening? Okay. Um, Brittany and the world out there, can I be here? Can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm trying to open the active speaker window so that I can see myself. There I am. Okay. Um, uh, thank you so much for this uh, invitation. I was looking forward to uh, really being there, but this is a pretty um, uh, good, uh, you know, alternative. I, at least I'm with you today. Um, and thank you, um, principally Brittany Locker, uh, Professor Brittany Locker, for the um, the invitation. And let me um, be the first um, to offer congratulations 
to all the wonderful prize winners in art history and indeed to say uh, congratulations to everybody who has actually managed to um, function in the academic system during this altogether surprising uh, spring of 2020. So um, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm actually going to have, uh, let's see, what would the word be? The temerity, the nerve, the cheek to um, present to you today um, aspects of this new book of mine. Um, I thought it might be interesting to say a few things, not only about its coverage, um, but about where on earth um, this idea came from uh, anyway. So uh, you see the cover there. And there are a couple of things that um, are asking for an explanation right away. What is the bell a poke? What, what word, what, why use that term? Um, well, my editor didn't want dates on the, on the front of the book. That's one reason. But the Belle Epoque is a, is a, is a, is a collective uh, sort of chronological category that was invented pretty well into the 20th century that delineates the period between the, the Paris Commune, 1871, and the beginning of the Great War, uh, 1914. So that's the territory uh, covered um, by this book. I think. Um, I think I'd like the next slide while I say a few more introductory words. Thank you. What you see on the screen here are um, works by uh, two, um, two uh, uh, artists who were visitors uh, to France. Uh, on the left, an American, Charles Courtney Curran. This is his Paris at Night from 1889. And on the right, a painting by, I don't know, a guy that some of you may have heard of, a uh, Dutch guy, Vincent van Gogh, von Hoch, who um, uh, spent a number of uh, very, not very many, but memorable years in France at the end of his life. This is his starry night. This is the starry night, the other starry night. This is the starry night over the Rhone set um, in Provence um, between Arles and Trinquetay, 1888. I have these two slides uh, on the screen um, because it's really by looking at these two particular pictures that I started asking the questions that eventually turned into this, um, to this book. Um, in the case of the uh, picture on the left, it's a picture that um, belongs to the Terra Foundation. Uh, the Terra Foundation is headquartered in Chicago and this used to be a picture you could visit at least in storage in Chicago. And as I looked at it, I thought, uh, it took me a while to sort of adjust to it, but I began to realize that one of the things that Curran was working with was trying to find language for the simultaneity of a range of artificial illumination technologies. And I began to wonder about this, the, the significance of there being um, a, a number of competing illumination technologies um, at this time. And um, when I really looked at the picture by Van Gogh for the first time, it took me a while to realize that um, this was also a picture that whose primary theme is the competition between artificial light and natural light. In this case, um, it's a competition uh, between uh, the Big Dipper, some of you recognize that constellation glowing in the sky, and the new um, street lighting that had just been installed in Arles. Arles was a hectically modernizing, technology-mad small town in the south of France. And you can see the, the network gaslight along the edge of the river. When you first look at this picture, I think just sort of zooming by it, um, uh, uh, people have a tendency to think that what Van Gogh was primarily concerned with was finding a way to um, represent the reflection of starlight on the glossy, shiny surface of the Rhone. But the more you look at it, the more you realize that's not what he's doing. Those, those striated bars of yellow on the surface of the river, that's reflected gaslight. And in fact, if you wanted to think of this picture as being the figuration uh, of, uh, of a competition, the competition between gaslight and starlight. In this case, gaslight wins. It actually um, receives most of the strokes, most of the saturated yellow hue. So it was really um, in two very separate occasions, my encounter with these two pictures that got me thinking about this. Let me say a couple of other things. A lot of you know, I'm sure, 
I can't, yes, everybody knows that Paris is called the city of light. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a nickname that has stuck for um, two and a half centuries and people don't ask very many questions about it anymore because people assume, don't they, that it has to do with light. It has to do with lights, illumination. Um, but in fact, uh, Paris was first called the city of light during, are you ready? The enlightenment, the 18th century, it was a metaphor. It morphed into a descriptive nickname in the years that um, I study, um, uh, namely um, by the middle of the 19th century, um, as uh, increasing numbers of gas lights were erected in the city during a, a large scale rebuilding, um, even without thinking about it, um, it began to be used in a descriptive way. I, um, I took an interesting angle into this. I, I got deeply involved with a kind of redefinition of the city of light because um, in the, in the history of art, um, uh, the entanglement of uh, in innovative art practices and light usually concerns natural light, sunlight. Um, uh, and in fact, um, art historians have been besotted by art and natural light for about 150 years. I decided to get out of the sunshine and uh, take a look at other kinds of lights because it turns out that changes in artificial illumination is one of the key things that actually defines um, the modern uh, metropolis in the 19th century. And in fact, Paris was understood to be the world headquarters of lighting um, innovation. Uh, the next, please. This is um, maybe, uh, this is a, a, a wood engraving that appeared in a technical journal. Um, uh, it was a technical journal that was founded in the years that interest me called Electric Light, La Lumière Electrique, because it was between about 1878 and 1882 that a number of experimental electric, electricity powered um, street lights were erected in high profile places in the city. These happen to be, this is pretty exotic, these are Yablokov candles, a particular iteration of electric arc light that were um, put up uh, for a few years on the Avenue of the Opera, the Avenue de l'Opera. And um, it was one of the places um, that people went to see the new light and to admire it and to denounce it. These were the years where um, people couldn't shut up about electric light. Electric light was the sort of, I don't know, the smartphone of the era. Um, you were either madly um, for them or against them. And so this sort of pattern of, of argumentation and acknowledgement um, constituted what I call, I hope not too pretentiously, illumination discourse. So um, what I got interested in then, the next slide, please. As I already um, sort of predicted um, with that comparison, is to ask questions about the involvement of art practices in a, in a range of media with the new lights, or to ask, and that's what's raised by this, um, what you have on the screen now, is to ask questions about why the new night lights were dramatically and consistently absent from the artworks that um, a lot of people, including lots of art historians, associate with being the key paintings of modern life in the French capital. Namely, here it comes, the Impressionists. What you see uh, here are two details um, of a high profile um, Impressionist painting of uh, modern Paris. This is a work by Gustave Caillebotte. It's called Rainy Day, 1877. It's um, one of the most beloved um, uh, pictures in that art museum in Chicago that used to be open, the Art Institute of Chicago. And what I'm showing you here by focusing on um, the center of the picture on the left and a detail of it on the right is this enormously dominant, dramatic, idiosyncratic green um, gaslight right in the middle of the picture. 
that is not illuminated. In fact, you can see in the detail on the right that the heavy use of white pigment um, uh, sort of insists upon the opacity of that area and it's not being lit. So I began to get interested in why in a lot of um, uh, Parisian paintings, the, the, the city was not shown lit up at night, whereas in paintings by a lot of non-Parisian modernists, the city was illuminated at night. Um, next, please. One of the pictures that I ended up getting very, very interested in indeed, maybe too interested, um, was this uh, very subtle, nuanced, evanescent portrayal of Twilight by another um, uh, non-French um, uh, uh, painter uh, who was nonetheless resident there for a long time, a name a lot of you will know, John Singer Sargent. This is um, one of his two Luxembourg garden pictures. This is painted in 1879. Now, um, oh, oh, you know how people, sorry, I'm not gonna say that everything's a long story, that's too boring. But um, so it turns out that this picture has, um, has no fewer than five different kinds of illumination in it. There are, um, there are orangey balls of gas light that you can see through the trees. There were brand new gas lights on a brand new boulevard that ran alongside the garden. Um, you can see uh, the light of the moon, uh, which is in the process um, of uh, rising. Um, you can see the, um, the heavy strokes of, a, of a reflected moonlight on the, on the basin there. Um, and you can see, if you look very, very closely, you can see the, um, the red, the glowing red ash on the end of that suave man's um, cigarette as he walks across the garden. Anyway, um, one of the things that interested me is that I discovered that directly alongside this garden, in exactly the year that Sargent was painting there, there was a big row of these glaring, eye-burning Yablokov candles on the street right alongside the park that would have shone intensely and maddeningly through those trees, which Sargent um, obviously saw but did not include in his picture. I got very interested in this. The next slide, please. Especially when I began to discover caricatures like this one. This is a great one. This is by one of the geniuses of French caricature whose pseudonym was Cham. This is uh, a drawing, uh, anyway, from about 1880. And guess what the title is? The moon resilvering herself in order to appear more brilliant than the light of Mr. Yablokov. As I already mentioned, Yablokov, a Russian expat who invented that electric art technology, this caricature more or less explains what Sargent's painting is about. Painting, um, Sargent is more or less painting on behalf of the moon and its lights, still struggling, still insisting, on being bright enough um, to illuminate the boat basin and to make it possible to read at twilight. Um, so you can see that Sargent's painting um, emerges um, right from this discussion about the new lights and uh, the consequences of the new lights. Uh, the next, please. And while I'm on the subject of caricature, um, certainly um, oh, I, I, one of the things that uh, emerged um, with a vengeance dramatically in the course of the, I hate to tell you how many years I spent on this book, was the degree to which these, these amazing caricaturists operating um, in um, the increasing possibilities for caricature publication in the expansion of the illustrated press in Paris and years, these artists, are in many ways the ones who responded most vividly, most wittily, most hilariously to the conditions of the new lights. On the left, you see the indispensable Sham again. <laughs> Here are these um, poor folks at night 
trying to make their way through the, the, the uh, Place de l'Opéra, the square in front of the Opera House. We've already seen that in that wood engraving I showed you, that a bouquet of those arc lights are shining there. And you can see um, the caption is, uh, an umbrella um, being used in the evening in order to cross the place, the place of the opera, which is to say those lights were so unbearable that you had to keep an umbrella, a parasol up over your head in order not to go blind on the way across. Um, this was a very good um, uh, set of years for optometrists in the city. Um, a lot of them were hawking blue lenses as the only way to protect um, your. And so, in fact, blue lens glasses became the equivalent of our um, anti-COVID masks at the moment. Um, on the right, um, uh, I'm showing you a, a constellation of uh, caricatures by the great um, caricaturist Drane. This was in reaction to um, <laughs> a, a, one of the great sort of moments in um, the history of spectacle and technology in Paris. This is in response to the International Exposition of Electricity that was held in Paris in 1881, the first ever, and that Paris, after much political negotiating, as was in fact the headquarters of this, was a way in which to sort of baptize Paris, if only briefly, as um, the electric capital. There are many funny things going on in this um, collection um, of uh, witty drawings. Um, one of them um, that you can see down on the lower left, I'm afraid that this particular um, form of joke um, expanded um, during um, the years of debate about the new lights. <sighs> lots of caricatures, lots of cartoons. Is there any funnier subject than a bourgeois man um, uh, uh, mauling a beautiful young girl? The, the new electric light provided an alibi. Oh, I didn't mean to touch you. I was temporarily blinded by the light. Um, uh, yeah, such was um, this kind of boulevard humor that was made um, even uh, was even more encouraged by all the, the jokes uh, about the blinding new lights. Okay, um, the next two, please. These, these very subtle um, prints, largely etching with uh, Aquatint um, by two of the leading um, artists of the period who are also extremely important innovators in intaglio um, printmaking, Mary Cassatt on the left, Edgar Degas on the right. These two works, which are obviously black and white because they are prints, um, right? Um, printed with uh, black ink. One of the things that I talk about in this book of mine, um, maybe the topic that ended up being the most sort of absorbing for me um, was the way in which this set of intensive nonstop experiments by this tiny group of artists, including Cassat and Dugas, who worked side by side in intaglio printmaking, which if any of you has ever tried it, is some of the most <laughs> technically, aesthetically demanding um, kind of work you're ever likely to do. I ended up being able to argue that in a number of ways, this immersion in black and white art making, right? 100% tone, 0% color. I ended up being able to argue that this too was an immersion in the argument, in the awareness about the changing visualities of the city of Paris. And in fact, this wonderful um, uh, piece by uh, Cassatt over there on the left, which is just called Under the Lamp, I was able to make the case, I think convincingly, that that lamp that you see, this is, a, this is set inside of her own apartment. It's a complicated kind of lamp. It's a moderator lamp. I ended up, thanks to some lamp nerds, friends of mine, um, I ended up being able to find out where the lamp was bought. Um, she cuts the chimney off the lamp. It's an oil lamp. It has to have a chimney. And I think you might, you might agree that the way in which this chimneyless moderator lamp appears in a print of an interior like this is 
referencing those crazy eye burning arc lamps out in the street um, that everyone was arguing about. Degas references them in a different way with these kind of buoyant bubbles of um, gas globes um, in his uh, etching that you see here. Next, please. And if you sort of um, make your way through um, a lot of these works by uh, especially Cassatt and uh, Degas in these years, you'll see the degree to which the preoccupation with finding a way to represent, include all these competing um, lights in the city in these years. This um, is a lithograph in this case by Degas from between 1879 and 1880 um, inside a particular cafe. Um, and you'll see that it includes gaslight, arc light, gaslight, arc light, uh, gaslight, and candlelight, and fireworks, and this, and um, the rising moon in the background. So again, the whole idea of finding, of insisting that a sort of concatenation of different lights is really um, what defines um, uh, the city of Paris in the last decades of the 19th century. Next, please. So you saw this when I first started talking and, and in many ways, it's a critical picture for me. In fact, it's the one that my, um, my publisher um, decided to put on the cover of the book. I just happen to have a copy of the book right here, just in case, I don't want you to think I'm trying to sell books, but anyway. Um, uh, uh, and it, it was, as I said, it was a picture that got me started on the project in many ways to begin with, but in, in, a, in a more, um, complicated way. Curran is an American in Paris. He's only there for about, he's there for about three years. And then he goes back and has quite um, a, a, a commercially successful um, career back on the East Coast of the United States when he returns. But he, like many other visitors to the French capital, and the French capital was, you know, chock-a-block with artists, students from all over the world in these years. This was the place that you went to be trained as an artist. This was the place that was understood to be the, uh, at the time, the world headquarters of contemporary art. And it also had, as you probably know, um, some pretty good museums where you could study the art of the past. Anyway, my point is, it was only artists from elsewhere, especially Americans, who showed Paris at night um, uh, blazing with a variety of artificial lights. As I suggested when I showed you that Kaibot at the beginning, the Parisian modernists um, did not show avenues, boulevards, sidewalks, and so forth ablaze um, with artificial lighting. Um, answering the question, why not, is one of, the, um, uh, one of the, or why in the case of the Americans and why not in the case of the Parisians is uh, one of the things that I um, struggled with um, in, in the book. Um, yeah, let's have the next one, please. Another artist who um, he ended up being an extremely, he's an extremely cosmopolitan, peripatetic artist who um, worked in many places in Western Europe in these years. You might not recognize this at first, even though he's such, his art is so well known and his name is so much in circulation. This, my friends, is a work by this young Norwegian guy who was living uh, uh, in Paris in these years. This is an Edvard Munch. This is a painting from 1890. It's called The Night in Saint Cloud. That's the name of the riverside town that he lived in. He had a rented room there in 1890. It was one bend of the river out from central Paris. This is the first one on this theme that he did. He ended up doing others in, uh, and then eventually in print media as well. Um, but this is, as it were, the first one, the original. It hangs in Oslo today. And it was one of tremendous interest to me because it shows someone who is shut up in the interior, but dressed to be outside and indeed paying rapt attention to the concatenation of different kinds of lights out the window 
including the blazing lights on the steamer on the river that could be seen outside. But it doesn't take very long to realize that the primary source of illumination in this particular room is the moonlight that cascades in the window. So you have this huge um, uh, beam, right, of dispersed moonlight um, inside the rented room that competes with and contrasts with the sparkling lights that can be seen out the window. So this was another um, uh, important picture for me, um, thinking about um, the perspective of um, outsiders, um, temporary visitors to the city, as opposed to those whose practices were headquartered there. Um, the next, please. So, um, as is often the case, I'm sure that a lot of you experience this in, you know, whatever, um, whatever practice, whatever discipline, whatever it is that you do for a living that you embark on a project and you realize at a certain point, oh God, there's so many things I didn't do. What am I gonna do? Am I gonna work on this project for the rest of my life? Am I gonna stop? Am I gonna, am I gonna actually admit that there are certain things I didn't do? Well, it's usually a good thing to admit that there are things that you didn't do, but you gotta be prepared to explain why you didn't do them. So, um, uh, as, I worked, um, as I worked on this project, um, it was always expected, <laughs> another artist who's quite close to a household name, it, it, was, it was expected that Toulouse-Lautrec would, um, would be a primary um, candidate for discussion in this book. Because if anyone is associated with nightlife in fin de siècle Paris, it's certainly, um, it's certainly Lautrec. Um, elsewhere, I've talked about him being the inventor of wicked Paris. And so a poster like the one that you see here, um, you see um, uh, the stars of and uh, customers of um, a very brash um, new nightclub in Paris, the Moulin Rouge, it's still there. And I discovered, I mean, you know, so my, my primary concern was, you know, to talk about the competition between lights in the first era of prominent um, electric light, but, um, but gas light certainly survived as being the dominant um, light in Paris. I mean, in fact, Paris was only the electric capital for two years. But anyway, so why didn't I do Toulouse-Lautrec? Because it turns out, guess what? A hundred percent of the night lights included in Toulouse-Lautrec's extraordinary work, guess what? It's all gas light. There's no electric light at all. So he was excused. He was, uh, he was able to leave the room. And um, uh, the conclusion to my book is actually a sort of long, I hope not too um, unconvincing discussion of why uh, Toulouse-Lautrec ended up um, not being one of the uh, artists whose works I talked about. Anyway, I think that I'm gonna stop. I think it's a good idea. I'm gonna stop talking and um, I think that uh, Jan, um, Jana Irwin, who's uh, uh, from the Ulrich Museum is going to uh, join me here. And I will have the pleasure, I hope, of uh, responding to some questions that some of you might have asked about uh, this stuff. Jan, are you there with me? I am. Hey. <laughs> Hi, Holly. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Holly. Um, I'm going to be moderating all of your questions. And, and um, so start sending them in. And while we're waiting uh, for everyone to post their uh, questions for Holly in the, in the chat room, um, on the on the YouTube channel, um, Holly, why don't you tell uh, us? Reading, do you want me to tell a, um, a a Wichita joke? Yes, please. So, um, so when I first came to uh, Wichita State University, um, everybody, um, it's it, it's a sort of a local thing. Everybody, you know, kept calling me Dr. Clayson. And I thought, you know, I, this business of being called Dr. Clayson, I don't know, it makes me feel like I work in a hospital. I don't know. So I finally had to say, you know, you have to stop calling me Dr. Clayson because frankly, 
I haven't finished my PhD. So if you really want to keep up this kind of nomenclature, you're going to have to start calling me Nurse Clayson. So it didn't work. I couldn't get the students to call me Nurse Clayson, but they started calling me Professor Clayson, and that was better. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, here we have a question for you um, from the WSU Shift Space Gallery. They ask, um, what got you interested in different light sources initially? Well, I think, um, I think that when I started noticing that, uh, you know, when you sort of study the, the art of this period, everybody's talking about landscape painting, landscape painting, landscape painting. It's all about sunshine and clouds. And then I began noticing that in certain paintings, there was obviously an interest in the night as well as, or instead of the day. And there was an interest not only in the, in the luminosities of light, but in the infrastructure, the hardware of lighting. And I thought, since Paris is called the city of light, so shouldn't somebody, well, no, it wasn't that I was on a quest, but uh, in, in French, it's handy because the word for, lum, for light is lumière, and the word for lighting is éclairage. So they're very distinct words. And I thought that what I needed to do is I needed to, 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 to separate lumière from éclairage and begin to talk about the, the contest between them and the difference between them. So um, once I sort of set that up as a project, then, you know, oh God, then I became I'm trying to get over it now, the biggest lamp nerd um, on earth. All I could talk about was light bulbs and light fixtures. And, um, you know, I would stop people in the street to start discussing, you know, street lamps anyway. So anyway, that's sort of where it started. Um, and uh, I don't know, it sort of turned out that, that it, it, it hadn't been talked about before. You would, you, it's hard to imagine that there's anything left to say about um, that moment in French art, but by George, there was something. So I hope that's something of an answer. Excellent. Um, Elizabeth asks, or comments, um, she says, Holly, thank you for your lecture. I've been thinking about, yeah. I've been thinking about modernity and um, uncertainty. Uh, for obvious reasons, I was planning on being with you in Wichita instead of Zooming from New York. Um, and she says, I am struck by how your account makes it clear that technologies of artificial illumination developed unevenly over the 19th century. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's see. Of course, that's an excellent question coming from Elizabeth. Um, uh, one here, here's a way to begin to answer the question, Elizabeth. Yes, um, uh, unevenly and in in, 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 in in pitched competition with one another. One of the problems was um, a problem having to do with French nationalism and xenophobia, namely the person who is most associated with the perfection of a key electric uh, lighting uh, technology, namely um, the incandescent bulb. Um, a guy named Thomas Edison, uh, and he was an American. Um, so there was also a lot of pushback against certain electric lighting technologies because they were not French, they were American. Um, and uh, as it turned out, it was gaslight that, that actually was the dominant lighting technology in Paris until, until the, the years between the two world wars. So I, when I started writing this book, I thought we were going to entitle it Electric Paris, and it turned out that that would not have been right. We would have had to title it Gaseous Paris, and that didn't seem like a winning proposition for a book title. So in fact, the competition between both, you know, sort of just in terms of flat out environmental difference and extraordinary political and commercial competition between those who control different lighting technologies and hardware certainly is one of the, um, the key ingredients of Parisian modernity, um, no doubt about it. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know, yeah. 
Um, and in fact, you know, the thing that I made such a to-do about those electric arc lamps, they were put up at great expense, the city council's bright idea, um, between 1878 and 1882, and then they took them all down and threw them away. Excellent, thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions they'd like to pose to Dr. Clayson? If so, type them into the chat and I will share them. That now I do have a PhD now, it's okay. <laughs> Well, it looks like that's all the questions we're going to have today, but well, thank I, you. Thank you for your kind attention. And again, I really want to congratulate the, the, the prize winners who are about to be acknowledged. Um, it's always a great thing, right, <laughs> to be a prize winner, especially in art history. And to have made your way through this challenging year is also, you know, full marks, hats off, four stars to everybody. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Clayson. So I'm, I'm, thank you for having me. Uh, it was a pleasure. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks um, again to Dr. Clayson. That was really a great talk. I loved it. And Gaseous Paris made me laugh out loud. Um, so now I'm, I'm really pleased that we get to the reason that we're all here, which is our students. We introduced the Art History Awards last year to shine a spotlight on the excellent work they do in this discipline. It's normally hidden inside the classroom or produced in papers that only myself and my colleague, Dr. Claudia Peterson, get to see. Um, so now you can all hear about it too. And each recipient will receive a certificate and a book tailored to their interests and chosen from Watermark Books. Dr. Pearson and I will be presenting several awards in different categories. So uh, let's get started with outstanding performance in art history courses. Um, our first recipient is Kaylin Blanca. Kaylin has taken several courses with me and she always goes beyond the course requirements. She asks thoughtful questions and writes insightful essays and is willing to take on hard work outside of the classroom. So congratulations, Kaylin. Our second recipient is Emily Cass. Um, I tried really hard, but could not convince her to switch to an art history major. Uh, nevertheless, she's made incredible contributions in all the classes she's taken with me. I know that I can count on her for great comments and insightful questions, and I've always appreciated having her in my classroom. So congratulations, Emily. Our third recipient is Hannah Issa. Uh, Hannah has always been a pleasure to have in class, but this semester, She's really demonstrated exceptional engagement with the course material um, in our toughest class, which is about reading and thinking through art theory. More than that though, she has shown um, kindness and an open-mindedness when she responds to her classmates. It's really rare and impressive. And she has very graciously put up with my incredibly thick American accent in both French and Arabic. You got a little sample of that earlier this evening. Uh, even though she's a native speaker of both, uh, so I'm gonna thank her first and then also say congratulations, Hannah. Our fourth recipient, Micah Parga. Um, Mai has consistently done great work in our history classes and she was also a standout in the art theory class. Uh, she engages all of the readings, even the most dense and consistently asks really smart and challenging questions. Um, she also drew on her life experiences to enrich our conversations and responded to her classmates thoughtfully, even when it was really obvious that they disagreed. So congratulations, Mai. Now, Dr. Peterson will join us to announce the next three awards. Thank you everyone for, um, for putting up the awards and thank you um, all of you out there uh, watching it. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Clayson also for uh, that wonderful uh, talk. I'm looking forward to read your book. <laughs> um, so um, we can go on maybe. Uh, 
the next slide. So I'm going to be uh, congratulating the uh, ORDs uh, under the category growth as an art historian. And the first one uh, is Jalen Cooper. Congratulations, Jalen. Um, I should note that um, if you don't like the books, you should talk to my colleague. She chose them. <laughs> okay, so the next one, uh, Louise McCall. Um, uh, congratulations, Louise. Um, and one more, I think, uh, Jada uh, White Rock. Congratulations. Um, I hope to see you all back in the fall. Um, enjoy the summer as much as you can and um, be well and stay safe. So I'm gonna um, uh, pass the word on to Xenia Gurstein, who is the curator at uh, the Old Rich Museum and she's presenting a special award for us. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, thanks for having me and giving me a chance to be part of this ceremony like everyone else. I'm sorry it's not happening in person, but I'm excited that it's happening. So I'm Ksenia Gerstein. I'm the Curator of Modern Contemporary Art at the Ulrich Museum. And uh, Jana Irwin, who spoke earlier, and I are representing the Ulrich at this event tonight. And we're both really happy to be helping ABSI to post it um, because it's about you know, sort of acknowledging and appreciating research in art history and, you know, building that kind of appreciation for art and art history is core to the mission of the Ulrich Museum of Art. And one of the ways we do that um, on campus is by having an internship program. It's called the Mary Joan Wade Internship Program, supported very generously by a WSU alumna, an artist named Mary Joan Wade. And that program allows us to give um, art history students as well as students in other disciplines opportunities to have professional experiences at a museum which they can take to other museums or other nonprofits or other professional contexts, but hopefully learn and grow on the job in that way. Uh, Jana and I are always happy to answer questions about the program if you have them, if you're interested at all in a museum internship, feel free to reach out to us. So um, this year, we were really lucky to have two amazing art history majors as our education and curatorial interns. And those interns were Carter Bryant and Nellie Elliott. And I'm here to present to them tonight uh, the Award for Outstanding Research Project. There they are. Um, um, which they uh, worked on as part of their internship at the Ulrich. They together, they worked to organize uh, the Ulrich's very first um, Wikipedia edit-a-thon, which took place in early March, thankfully before, <laughs> before uh, COVID-19 hit us all. Um, and it was part of a global movement, not just national, but truly global, promoted by an organization called Art Plus Feminism, in order to reduce the gender gap, the gender gap in um, knowledge about women artists um, that is present in Wikipedia as in a lot of other spheres of life. So for this project, Carter and Nelly conducted really deep research in the museum's files and archives in our library, in the university's library and compiled nearly two dozen kind of very extensive dossiers with bibliographies on women artists in the Ulrich Collection and um, activist artists in the Ulrich Collection, which then allowed 23 people who showed up as volunteers for our event to create new articles and primarily improve and build on existing articles, sort of significantly improving the quality of the knowledge available out there in the world on Wikipedia about all of those artists. So we hope to continue this event next year. Again, we're really, really grateful to Carter and Nelly for the very high bar they set in um, organizing every aspect of this first event. And so I think their award is very much deserved and well-earned. It was an outstanding research project. And of course, like everyone else, they'll each be getting a book that you're seeing on your screen. 
And um, again, I just want to say thank you to all of you watching at home. Thank you to ATSI for inviting us all rich folks to participate and congratulations to Nellie and Carter. And now I will sign off. Although this event celebrates the study of art history, we also want to take an opportunity to recognize outstanding graduates in art education, graphic design, and studio art, as well as an outstanding graduate student. So I would like to read some comments from Lily's faculty mentor, Jennifer Ray, the area head for photography. Lily has, in the past few years, been included in 20 group shows throughout the Midwest, and she was included in the Salina Biennial curated by Kusinia Gerstein. She has had three solo shows and has been involved in local community centers, including Positive Directions and the Wichita Area Sexual Assault Center. She also covered classes for Jennifer Ray at the beginning of the semester, going above and beyond graduate expectations. She's deeply committed to building community amongst students in ADSI and across the university. She's generous, committed to her students, and she fearlessly tackles difficult subject matter and is incredibly brave in her art. Congratulations, Lily. I have some uh, prepared comments from Dr. Lori Santos, Area Head for Art Education. Vin is an exceptional student, very creative and conscientious. He works really hard to always do his best and provides meaningful contributions. He has readily shared his insights and personal travel experiences about art and cultural diversity. He took strong initiative in his participation with our Storytime Village Little Free Library Project. He devoted several hours to complete one of four free little libraries and also organized high school student participation with this project. During his student teaching internship, he worked numerous extra hours to provide one-on-one -on -one instructions for students who desired to work more intently on skill uh, in drawing and painting. Vin is a strong teacher candidate and is the first of our art ed graduates for this year to be hired by Wichita Public Schools for the next school year. We are extremely proud of him and the work he has done. We know that he will continue to make a great difference in art education and for his future students. Congratulations, Ben. Um, some comments by graphic design faculty member, Dr. Irma Puskarovich. I had the privilege to work with Madeline on projects both inside and outside the classroom. She has shown great dedication to every project, but also skills in working within a group and collaborating and being respectful to her teacher and classmates. Many students have these qualities but I nominated Madeline because she possesses something else as well. She has a unique vision, work ethic, craft, and style. She is very inquisitive and passionate about design and design matters. Due to this, she has already developed a voice that is recognizable. I believe that her open-mindedness, thirst for knowledge, and artistic talent will make her a brilliant designer. Congratulations. Um, and here are some comments provided by Ceramics Area Head, Ted Adler. Kat's awesome. She was president of the Ceramics Guild and she's earned academic achievements. But more than that, I see her interact with other students and she really supports her friends and colleagues. I've never seen her be negative, even though she's gone through a lot. She's perseverant, kind, compassionate, and the strength of her character comes through when times are tough. And she's so humble, she never puts herself at the center of attention, but instead she's always ready when there's work to do. She also challenges herself in her art and sets her own bar. Her work has grown more and more and she's developed her own voice and creative vision. She just rocks. Congratulations, Kat. Uh, it is my absolute delight to present the award for Outstanding Art History graduate to Carter Bryant, who is an exceptional student in every respect. It has been my pleasure to watch Carter grow as a scholar and his recent work on semiotics and signaling queerness in the works of American painter Paul Cadmus um, tells me he's ready to tackle graduate school with a plum, which is why Carter is getting this extremely graduate level uh, reading material here. More than that, he's a self-motivated learner 
who not only takes up advantage of the opportunities provided by the university, but goes out into the world and makes his own opportunities. He's curated exhibitions in multiple locations around Wichita, including Newman University. He's also unfailingly thoughtful and kind in his interactions with other students. These traits tell me that Carter can succeed no matter what obstacles are placed in his path. And I frankly expect him to become a star in the art world and suspect that someday I might be working for him. So congratulations, Carter. Um, Rodney Miller, the Dean of the College of Fine Arts couldn't join us live today, but he did record closing remarks. So um, one more time, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you so much to um, Dr. Clayson uh, for that really extraordinary talk. Uh, thank you, Jana Irwin and um, Emily Christensen for, um, for all the work you did on this presentation and I will leave you with. This is an afternoon to recognize accomplishments and impart to you graduates and even to those of you who are continuing your career here at Wichita State, some last words of wisdom before we send you off into the summer and into the world in some cases. So here they are. All passes art, elope epidures. Let me repeat that. All passes art, elope epidures. Uh, some of you may not know, but my earlier career was as a professional opera singer. Uh, some time ago, uh, I was engaged by an opera company in New York, and the uh, proscenium that, of their theater had a very ornately carved phrase, all passes, art alone endures. The problem reading it, however, was twofold. First, the Art Deco lettering was so florid that the N looked like a separate P and I. Secondly, there was no punctuation, no period after the word art. So the optical illusion, therefore, created at first glance was a nonsensical phrase. All passes art, elope epidures. It took a longer, more careful look to decipher the real quote and the one that I want you to remember. All passes, art alone endures. Remember that. All passes, art alone endures. Most of what we remember of previous cultures, we know from their art. Greek and Roman architecture, the paintings and sculpture of the Italian Renaissance, the literature of Victorian England, the symphonies of 19th century uh, Germany the jazz and rock and roll of 20th century America. All passes, art alone endures. The one thing that separates humans from every other species is self-reflection. Humans are the only species that asks questions, and we are the only one that asks the eternal question, why? The qualitative way that we answer that question is the arts. Anthropologists have uncovered ancient civilizations with no written language, no concept of math or of time. They have never discovered one without art. All passes. Art alone endures. One of the most unique movies to come out of Hollywood recently is George Clooney's The Monuments Men. It chronicles the true attempt during World War II of allied scholars to track down thousands of paintings, sculpture, and other mediums that were being systematically looted and in many cases destroyed by the Axis powers. Why would these men put themselves in harm's way, and in some cases giving their life, in an effort to save works of art, specific works of art? Because they recognized that one of the elements at stake in that war was civilization itself. And art is the most essential element in that equation. All passes, art alone endures. One of the most profound musical compositions of all time 
is the quartet for the end of time, written by French composer Olivier Messiaen in 1940. It's written for violin, clarinet, uh, and piano. He wrote it while a prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp, and those were the only instruments at his disposal. Today, it's one of the most famous masterworks in the repertoire. Why would anyone in his right mind waste time and energy writing or playing music in a concentration camp? There was little food, water, or warmth. There was torture, filth, infestation. There was, most of all, death. And yet, from those camps, we have poetry, we have drawings, we have paintings, we have music and all forms of literature. Why? In a place where people are only focused on survival, on the bare necessities, the obvious conclusion is that art must be somehow essential for life. The camps were without money, without hope, without commerce, without recreation, without basic respect, but they were not without art. Art is part of survival. Art is part of the human spirit, an unquenchable expression of who we are. Art is the way we say, I am alive and my life has meaning. All passes, art alone endures. Simultaneously, even as one group was risking their lives to preserve what they perceived to be the most significant works ever created by civilization, others, at the end of their lives, were desperate to create their own artistic statements. Why? Because when circumstances conspire to strip us of our humanity, we are determined to do the most human thing that we can, art. All passes, art alone endures. Besides this macro level, however, there is a more personal metaphor at work for each of you. All other dreams, all other aspirations, all other paths, they have fallen away. That is why you are here today, receiving your degrees from this college and this university. This is not an easy path, and for some of you, the rewards will not match the sacrifice. But for all of you, you already know this. All passes. Art alone endures. This is